Bienvenidos a una nueva edición de Tópicos Selectos de Cardiología, proyecto en colaboración con la revista colombiana de cardiología. El tópico que vamos a cubrir hoy es acerca de la enfermedad estructural y su tratamiento eh, intervencionista. Especialmente, esta es una charla donde habla de la evolución del de reemplazo valvular aórtico eh, endovascular, lo que llamamos nosotros TAVR, y va a mostrar básicamente la evolución desde el principio del origen de estas tecnologías hasta los desarrollos el día de hoy. Esto de verdad es una charla que es muy educativa, no solamente para el intervencionista, pero también para el cardiólogo clínico en general, pues muestra la evolución de esta tecnología a través del tiempo y la transición de la parte quirúrgica a básicamente los procedimientos intervencionistas. De verdad que espero que disfruten esta charla que me parece muy importante para, para toda nuestra audiencia y ojalá que nos volvamos a ver de nuevo el próximo mes con otro tópico de interés para ustedes. But when you see the anatomy directly, it's really quite impressive. Um, Ajay, when he made the course, asked me to talk about my, my perspectives on structural heart and TAVR uh, revolution or evolution, uh, so as it may be, um, and sort of give a perspective on uh, wh where we've come from and where we, where we are. I mean, this is a typical patient that we see now, an 88-year-old gentleman, hypertension, normal renal function, who gets admitted with class 4 symptoms. You know, 10 years ago, when I, when, when we, when I started in, in this field, didn't know what the STS risk score was. Um, but now we routinely calculate on every patient, and I'm sure most of you are, are aware of this, whether it's for AVR, MVR, cabbage. The surgical risk calculator is an important piece of the evaluation process. So this gentleman has a surgical risk score of uh, 6%. Um, and you know, years ago, there used to be a question, TAV, a SAVR or TAVR. And I think most of us would say at this point, there's not a question that it should be transcatheter uh, aortic valve replacement. But we go through the evaluation. He's got severe uh, and, and, uh, aortic stenosis. His anatomy, routinely we get CTAs, and we'll talk about this in a little bit. His anatomy looks ideal for a transcatheter valve. There's a little bit of LVOT calcium. The sizing is appropriate. Um, and this gentleman got a Sapien 3 valve. Um, oops, there we go. And he had very mild paravalve regurgitation after. You see the valve being deployed there. He had a trace AR and he went home on post op day two. It's a very different evolution. Um, 88 year old gentleman with severe AS who initially the option would have been surgery and now he gets a transcatheter valve, he goes ho to home and not to rehab, not somewhere else, he goes to home on post-op day two and I think that's really where, where these patients are, 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 this is where they want, they, this is what they want, this is what they're striving for. But it, it's really within a 10 year process and how do we get where, where we are with TAVR is an important question to keep in mind. This was our first case at Columbia uh, in June of 2005. I was a last year of my interventional cardiology uh, fellowship. We did a transvenous transfemoral case, and this was how Alain Cribier had done his initial cases, the majority of his initial cases. Um, we had severe aortic regurgitation. We sized the valve, uh, sorry, that video went away, but we had sized the valve based on a transthoracic echo. Uh, we didn't understand what we were doing with sizing. We had one size valve, a 23 millimeter valve, deployed the valve. The gentleman had severe aortic uh, regurgitation. Didn't quite understand why he had it. We didn't even think about it. Um, and he ended up dying about two, two to three days later from multi-organ failure from severe uh, aortic regurgitation. And Alain Cribier had come as our proctor. And so after that first case, then we did a, a second case two days later. Um, again, uh, with, with the proctor, with Alain Cribier as our proctor. Um, and this transvenous transeptal approach was very challenging. And what we ended up in this case is we lacerated the mitral valve. You're putting a stiff wire across the LV, uh, and we ended up lacerating the mitral valve. Uh, the patient had severe MR and ended up dying on the table. And these were our first two cases. And I remember sitting in, in uh, Marty Leon's office after the second case, and Marty called uh, Larry Wood, who you guys may not know, but he, he was sort of, at the, he's, uh, he's one of the, he's, he heads the transcatheter program at Edwards. Uh, at this point, he was sort of directing the research effort. And Marty, I remember sitting there and Marty saying, either you have to stop this trial or I'm going to stop it. Basically saying, I'm going to call the FDA. 
um, because he, he just this wasn't a viable procedure. And even if you could manage to do it, uh, the, the feeling was this was not a reproducible procedure. There were there were too, there was too much going on, and it was not a viable procedure. So at this point, this was the revival one study, um, which never got published or never got really discussed, and we sort of forgot about it because we we didn't want to remember it. Uh, and the, the the trial stopped, and it was it was decided that we weren't going to proceed any any further at that point. Uh, and it was officially stopped two days after that, but it's really stopped after our, our second case. Bill O'Neill had done uh, about five cases, but uh, it just wasn't a reproducible procedure. And then so. They, Edwards iterated and redesigned, and it became what the procedure is today. It was a retrograde procedure, like a balloon valvuloplasty, uh, and this was the Revival II study. This was our first patient. About six uh, or eight months later, uh, in February of 2006, and it was a, it was a ret retrograde tra uh, transarterial procedure. Uh, and we did well for about the first eight patients. And then patient nine in the Revival II study, Patient, the procedure went well. It was overall patient 10, uh, and, but on extubation, patient had hemiparesis. And we did a cerebral angiogram, sort of slow flow, microemboli, but the patient, and the patient never recovered. Had dense neurologic deficits, discharged rehab, but died about five months post-procedure. And so we, this is when we, our first experience at it locally with embolic complications and understanding that this is a real problem with this procedure. This was the next patient, and this, this video has been shown multiple times. Oh, let me just play it again. Sorry. It looks like a gunshot wound, and this, this was trying to put up a 24 French sheath. We, we tore the iliac, um, and we never got to the procedure. This gentleman fortunately survived, but he never got his valve replaced. He had an aorto... Uh, uh, bifem graft uh, that uh, restored flow. But we learned that the iliac angio was not adequate, that we had to look at CTs, we had to look at calcium, and we had to understand that what the anatomy looked like. And these devices were large and bulky at that time. And that was our first experience, and we became experts in, in looking at images. Although the radiologist looked at the CT, we also reviewed it every time <coughs> to see whether we can get access. And this is an ideal access, and we don't really question it. But there were many patients like the access before where there was a lot of calcium and understanding what the limitations of the device were. And then uh, this was our, our next patient. Uh, I'm sorry, we had one good case in between, but this, was our, this video won't play, but this was our um, patient number uh, 11 in revival, too. And we ended up uh, perforating, I'm not perforating, I'm sorry, dissecting the aorta. We couldn't cross the valve. The, the, initial, the initial device was basically a valve crimped onto a Z-Med balloon, so a valvuloplasty balloon. And you can, even though the video doesn't play, you can see we, send it, we created this ascending aortic dissection. So in those four cases, we had embolic event, aortic dissection, and a major vascular complication uh, in the iliacs. Uh, and it, it was not a great uh, series of cases, but this was our experience in the Revival II study. Uh, 29 retrograde transfemoral. You know, we had five major vascul vascular complications, and they weren't trivial ones. We had three iliac convulsions re requiring aorta bifem and two aortic dissections that died. Of those 29 patients, we had procedural deaths, in, essentially in hospital deaths in five of the patients. So it takes a, a lot of effort and, and time and patient courage to continue this, the, this data and, this con, and, the, and accumulating this data. But we learned a lot with these feasibility trials, and that's the thing to keep in mind. Whether, when we get to the mitral space, you know, we shouldn't have this expectation that the mitral device are going to work. It, the, these trials are feasibility trials, and the term feasibility is an important one. Uh, and you're, you're going to learn. You're going to learn whether it works, whether it doesn't. And a lot of these cases are not going to go well. And we learned that early on with transcatheter valve. So we got alternative access. This is our first TA approach in December of 2006. I was a first year attending. Patient did well. Um, a patient was extubated in the OR, but just never recovered. It was a thoracotomy, and it was a frail, frail 80-something-year-old woman that just never recovered. And we learned that uh, although the procedure may be a success, uh, the, the case wasn't a success. Um, the patient ended up just not recovering and having a, a major event. This was a case later we did, um, and this was about sizing. We, uh, you know, on trans, 2D transthoracic, we, we measured 25. 
we put a 26 millimeter valve, and unfortunately this video doesn't play, but this patient had severe AR. We thought there's no way this, this, this was a five foot four woman. And it was probably a bicuspid valve. We don't, I don't know at this point what it was, but it was, a, it was not a, a, a tall woman. It was a small woman, and she had severe AR, but we just never thought it would be bigger than a 26. But we had measured it on a trans thoracic, and she ended up going to surgery for her, her uh, aortic valve replacement. This valve was removed, and another one was sewn in surgically. But we, we learned a lot that at, at this time. Uh, you know, the annulus is not a circular structure that, you know, when you're looking at a 2D echo, oftentimes we're measuring where this red arrow is. And, uh, you know, we really need to understand that it's not circular, that it's elliptical. Yeah, we used, started to use biplane TE, uh, but the use of TE and, and CT, 3D TE and CT, really wasn't there in the early stages. It was because of sort of the evolution of the structural heart field that imaging sort of really evolved and caught up. And, and now it seems so straightforward, and, and it, was, it seems like, why do we do those things? It was stupid. Um, but it was that we didn't understand the anatomy. And, and it was, although we were working with our surgeons, we, ne we didn't have the technology also to, to image this. And, and uh, Mark showed you very nicely all of the imaging and, and looking at it from an uh, anatomic perspective. But how do you do that in a patient? And, and so the use of CT and 3DTE evolved to understand that we need to look at the annulus in a, in a three-dimensional model. So these were all, all of these things happened in the feasibility phase. And then in May of 2007, we, en we enrolled our first patient in the partner trial. And it's important to keep that in perspective. We talk about the partner trial. That, that trial is outdated. It, it's a 10-year-old study. The first patient was enrolled 10 years ago. When that trial was started, only three sites of the over 20 had ever done a transcatheter valve. And our learning was very limited. We didn't understand how to size. We didn't understand vascular complications. The devices were large. Um, and, you know, we really move, move forward relatively quickly um, with, with, the, with, the, with the trial, and we compared it to surgery. And our first coronary obstruction was in our patient 61 in June of 2008. And, you know, John Webb had published in circulation the fact that it was the native leaflets that occlude the coronaries. Um, but we, we learned these things early. We learned over time what includes the coronary. It's not the prosthetic valve, it's the native leaflets. So you have to imagine where the, na the native leaflet is going to sit when you do a transcatheter valve. And so you took a lot of measurements, height, width, diameter, the length of the leaflet, the location of the, of the left main, and you have to model in your head where is that leaflet going to sit. And you gotta define the anatomy of the landing zone and the entire structure. But the devices also started to evolve. You know, as I said, the original device didn't have a nose cone. It was just crimped on a balloon. But we learned that e e able to cross was easier when you had a nose cone. Aortic complications were less when you had a, a lower profile device. And this was um, in 2016, Sapien XT, we started the Partner 2 trial in intermediate risk patients. And when, when we talk about intermediate risk, that was, that was really oh, six years ago. And the, the first device that got approved in the U.S. Uh, was in 2011 was the original Sapien system with the Retroflex 3 system. And we did the first case in November of 2011, um, almost six years ago. And once the, the evolution was quick after that. Once you had commercial pr approval, people could think outside the box. You're like, all right, well, now we have this device, and there are patients that are not good surgical candidates. So we started doing a lot of off-label stuff. Um, the, the next month, we did our first valve and valve for bioprosthetic AS. Two months later, we did our first double valve and valve for, for failing aortic and mitral bioprosthesis from a transapical approach. We did our first tricuspid later that year. So once you had the device, people could say, okay, you know, this is a patient that's not surgical, but maybe we can do a transcatheter valve. And that's where the evolution went quickly once you had commercial approval. And it gave you opportunities. And we did our 500th case uh, about five years ago in July of 2012, and we've, we've done a, a little over 2,000. Over the last six years since approval, or five years since approval, um, the devices have evolved, and we've gotten, we're, we're now on our third generation devices, the Sapien 3 and the Evolute R are the commercially approved devices in the US. Um, and that's important to keep in mind. But to get here, we had to get an evidence base. And that's, it's, it's, it's one of the remarkable things. I mean, when you talk about the structural heart field, the real uh, change has been in the evidence. And, we, and I said, we talked about partner one. It was 10 years ago. It was a early stage device. It was when we didn't know what we were doing. 
And this is the inoperable uh, arm of, of the study. It was cohort B, patients who were not surgical candidates. And you can say, all right, there was a 20% absolute reduction in, mor in mortality that was maintained out. But there's also a, even patients that were treated successfully at five years, it was a 72% uh, mortality. Um, and, but, it, but you also saw the natural history of uh, untreated aortic stenosis. We did this, we also had an uh, arm of patients who were high, high risk. And you saw that it worked well in high risk patients. Um, and there was no difference between surgical AVR and TAVR. But again, it was a patient population that had a high mortality at five years. It's important to keep in mind that this trial, and I think we've published anywhere from 30 to 40 manuscripts from the Partner One trial. Um, but it's an outdated trial. It was early experience. It was before this, and we were comparing ourselves to surgery in some of the highest volume surgical centers. It was a 24 French sheath. There was no crossing uh, nose cone. And really, the, the, the evolution of the field started uh, to, I mean, the, the way we people th started talking about Tavern changed in about three, four years ago in ACC when the core valve high risk trial was pr uh, presented. And it started raising the question, you know, instead of being equal to surgery, is it potentially superior in this higher risk population? And this was the uh, surgical arm versus transcatheter. And it showed at one year, potentially, there was a survival benefit. And, and this wasn't just limited to the patients that had high STS scores or high risk. It was even seen in patients with an STS score less than seven. And the intermediate risk crowd, the partner 2A, it, when you look at the transfemoral arm, this was the Sapien XT device, and these were patients mean age 81, STS score around six. In the transfemoral arm, there was a survival benefit to transfemoral transcatheter valve compared to surgery with a p-value of 0.04. This was not the primary endpoint, and people can question that, but it was over 1,500 patients that were randomized in the transfemoral arm. It was a pre-specified analysis. And very quickly, the, you know, by the time the Partner 2A trial was presented, the device was obsolete. We had moved from Sapien XT to Sapien 3. So very quickly, the, the field has evolved. And in, Sapien, in the Sapien 3 intermediate risk study, at, at the, in the, the high-risk arm, in the intermediate risk arm, the average STS was 5.3, and the 30-day mortality was 1.1%. This was over 1,000 patients. And major stroke was less than 1%. Very quickly, you know, we had evolved from a procedure that we thought was very high risk and, and, and only limited to high-risk surgical patients to a procedure that had 30-day mortality of around 1% and a 30-day stroke rate of around 1% uh, for major stroke. So, you know, and this, this, this issue of is it equal to surgery or it, it started to change to is it superior? So when you looked at, the propens at a surgical cohort of patients, stroke rate was less with transcatheter valve than surgery. Um, and, Oh, sorry, this is an older slide set. And recently at, uh, at, at uh, ACC, just a, a month ago, the Sertavi data was presented, again, showing e comparable data to surgery. And that stroke rate, although it was not statistically different, was lower with, with transcatheter valve than surgery. And all this data really changed the conversation. Early on, we said, who does poorly with surgery? Let's do a transcatheter valve. The conversation changed from who does poorly to who does well with a TAVR. And, and I think a lot of us say, OK, an 82-year-old, they shouldn't get surgery, they should get transcatheter valve. And, and, and that's where the conversation has changed. But we have to do it responsibly and understand where is the difference. And there's been a lot of reasons for improvement. Uh, you, a lot of it is related to the, the imaging. We learned that it's a two-dimensional image on transthoracic echo is not adequate, that we gotta get CT or 3D TE to really understand what the annulus looks like, that it's not circular, that it's elliptical, that in some, as Mark showed, some patients have tremendous LVOT calcium that extends onto the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. And we can see this with our imaging now, based on both CT and echo. And 3D imaging is crucial to a, a successful procedure. So at this point, you know, we, we got to balance the risks of a transcatheter valve versus the risk of surgery. An 82-year-old who has an STS of 4%, if their anatomy is, is ideal like this patient, they should get a transcatheter valve. But if their anatomy shows a lot of LVOT calcium, that patient should get surgery. Because maybe you're not going to get an ideal result. Or if they have borderline access or your risk of complications are higher, I think we're balancing the risks of transcatheter valve with surgery. And you're looking at vascular access uh, as well. The other thing that we have to do responsibly is learn who not to treat. When you have a less invasive therapy, you're often pushed to treat patients that you probably should not treat. 
There are patients who are anatomically unsuitable for surgery but are great uh, TAVR candidates, and that's perfect. But the patient that's debilitated, that can't get out of bed because they're so weak and frail, their albumin is 2.8, or they're, they're demented, uh, you're not going to get the clinical benefit, and that patient should not be treated with, regardless of whether their anatomy is ideal or not. And early on, there's enthusiasm to do it, and whether early on in our experience, we were just wanted to figure out how to do the, the procedure, that we did a lot of cases that were inappropriate, but also programs starting out and, and physicians starting out have a, have a enthusiasm to, to treat patients, and they often push the envelope of who should be treated clinically. And the right calculation of who's, who's going to benefit is just not about a surgical risk score. It, it's about life expectancy. It's about comorbid conditions. And the risk-benefit ratio is going to be different for each patient. And you can have a 75-year-old a that has stage 4 lung cancer. You probably shouldn't treat. But there, you also will have a 75-year-old who takes care of his demented wife. Uh, and, and he's not looking at the 15-year uh, uh, results of a, of a surgical valve replacement, and it may be appropriate to treat that patient. And the risk-benefit analysis is going to be different from each patient. And the other reason that outcomes have improved is the devices have just iterated. And over this last 10 years, we've developed a new technology that's been disruptive. It's changed the field. And, and I don't think anyone can argue that. We've gotten a large evidence base, and we've said that, you know, patients that were not not only are we treating patients that were getting surgery, but we're also finding patients that never got referred for treatment. And I think that's one of the biggest things. These, the surgeons always had this population of patients that got surgery. But beyond that population, there were a ton of patients that just never got referred for surgery because no one wanted to go through open heart surgery. Clinical outcomes have improved through device iteration and refinement of procedural technique. And the guidelines have changed. Just last month, the new ACCHA guidelines were published. There's been a lot of improvement in imaging, and there's been rational dispersion for, of technology from these initial clinical trial centers to now over 500 sites that are doing transcatheter valve. And this concept of a heart team has really evolved, and I'll talk about that in, in just a bit. And, and the, the role of the heart team is to provide optimal care of the patient independent of, phys, of uh, physician bias. Um, and for, it goes from preoperative assessment to procedural care. And the reason we need a heart team are several people, and these are different arguments. Physicians are self-serving. An interventionalist wants to do an intervention, and a surgeon wants to operate because there, there, are, there are financial motives. And physician egos interfere with decision making. Often, you know, there, people are going to believe what they believe, and, and they're going to they're going to push that, their particular case. But also, more importantly, in complex cases, different perspectives can help with decision making. You can think outside the box. Well, maybe valve and valve is appropriate in this patient rather than a redo surgery. Uh, and the complementary skills can be useful in different procedures. But there's a lot of factors that affect the heart team decision. And you'll see this as you go out into practice, the physicians on the team. The heart team in concept works really well. It is great. But in some patients, in some, I'm sorry, in some centers, the, the CT surgeon is the, is the strongest person. In other centers, the interventional cardiologist is the strongest person. Uh, and who, who dictates that heart team? And in some centers, there are three interventional cardiology groups and, and two surgical groups. So who's on the heart team and who's strong? And you're going to see that it's going to uh, vary. And it's the dominant physician that often dictates the treatment uh, algorithm. And team strengths and weaknesses, and we've seen this from the Syntax study and others, that some centers are really good at PCI but not great at surgery, and other centers are really great at surgery and not good at PCI. And so the, people have to understand their strengths and weaknesses and their limitations, and that's going to often dictate things. And hospital politics uh, and, and finances, uh, and those often go, go together. The surgical uh, AVR is a, is a very profitable thing for many institutions. Um, and so, but transcatheter valve in many locations is not profitable, and that often dictates which, uh, which are, uh, pro are, are most used. And the, the role of the heart team has evolved. It, it, early on, it was like, okay, we just got to make sure we're treating the right patient, and how do we treat them? But now we're, we, it's become different, um, and we're talking about different skill sets and complementary skill sets and patient selection. That's the role, especially as we go down to a lower risk population. It's more important for the heart team to give a balanced perspective to the patient to allow the patient to make a decision, uh, whereas early on it, that wasn't the case. Now it's really about, okay, what, what's right for the patient? Let the patient make the decision. But there are a lot of challenges. 
you know, you, you want to all sit together, the two surgeons, the interventional cardiologist, the echocardiographers, your PA, but who's going to pay for all that? Who's going to, you know, for two hours a week, review the 10 cases that you saw that week? Who's paying for their time? Because none of this is reimbursed time, and, there, and there's a lot of financial limitations. And, you know, the hospitals have to be willing to support this if we're going to do this going forward. And, you know, we've got to, there's still a lot of un unanswered questions, and I don't have time to go through all of this, but from valve durability to what, what risk profile do we use, which valve do we use? We have two commercially approved devices. Within a year, we'll probably have a third. Um, and so how do you choose a valve? If, if a center is doing 20 cases a year, should they use more than one valve? How do they maintain the learning curve? Um, and then these evolving indications from low risk to valve and valve to bicuspid valves to moderate AS in a cardiomyopathic ventricle to uh, to asymptomatic AS, you know, th there's a lot of things that are going there. And, and the final thing is who should do the procedures and how do we train people? And there's this journey to becoming a, a, interventional cardiologists and how do you get training? And that's what all of you are asking. There's some of you that are interested in structural, some of you, you know, many of you are not. But, you know, how do you get training? Do you need a dedicated structural year? If you're going to do so, how do you choose a program? And if you're going to choose a program, what vo we haven't standardized volumes. We have for PCI that you should do 250 as a primary operator, but we haven't said that really for a, a structural heart program. Who's going to set those standards? It, which, which society is going to lead that effort? And, and th that's important to understand. Uh, and many people are saying, okay, you know what, I've already finished my training, and you're, this is not your group, but there's, you'll go to a job where there's a lot of senior operators that have said, okay, I'm going to do transcatheter valve. Because when you look at it, most people expect in, in, in within five years that more than 50% of interventional cardiology will be structural heart interventions. So a lot of these physicians that are in practice say, I need to, I need to start doing this. And so they do an apprenticeship or they do through, through the companies and uh, with industry support, learn the procedure. But I, just several things, you just, you know, wh whatever you're going to do, become an expert at coronary intervention first. The catheter skills are invaluable and will serve you well. Understand the disease that you're treating. It's not just a procedure. The majority of time I spend is taking care of the patient on the floor and I will spend an hour convincing a patient not to do a procedure and often takes longer and it's probably more relevant for us to, consi to, to uh, convince a patient and a family not to do the procedure than to actually do the procedure. And I think that's, that's more important than actually learning the technique sometimes. And the reality is there's a lot of structural heart interventions. Uh, Mark went through the entire anatomy and it's, it, it's remarkable. Um, you know, from aortic to mitral to pulmonic, left atrial appendage, PFO, ASD, all of these things are evolving. And it's really difficult to become an expert at all of these, um, as, well as, as well as coronary intervention. And so you have to understand, you, you need to prioritize. And you, you can't do everything. Create a team atmosphere. If you're fortunate enough to be helping to build a program, don't, don't say, I'm going to do everything. Someone can focus on one while you focus on another. And the team is not just your uh, physician colleagues, it's the entire fellows, the cardiologists, the nurses, the coordinators, and, and you got to share the load and make sure your training uh, training is adequate. Don't say you can do left atrial appendage when you haven't really looked at the anatomy or understood what the, what the potential risks are. Make sure whatever procedure you're doing, your training is adequate. And so when you're trained, you, you got to find a job, and that's one of our biggest challenges. You know, we, we train three structural heart fellows a year, uh, some international, some local. But you, you got to make choices, and you got to make compromises that sit that fit within your sort of family life and other things. And you're going to go for an academic job or a private job, um, and there there are pros and cons to both. There are some private jobs that are have higher volumes than the majority of academic jobs, and, the, and these private jobs are involved in clinical trials. Understand what you want to do. Are, are you are you trying to find a job where you, all you do is transcatheter valve or, or all you do is interventional cardiology, that's harder to do. And if you're looking for that job, then you have to make compromises on location versus opportunity. Um, you know, that you might find the ideal uh, job, but it's out in the Midwest. But you might want to, your wife or, or your husband may not want to live in the Midwest. So you got to make compromises, location versus opportunity. And dedicated structural versus a mixed practice. And you got to evaluating the opportunities. When you go out to look at an opportunity and, they, and the hospital brings you out to say, I'm going to, uh, I want you to build a structural program, that, and that's great. 
But the hospital may say that, but the cardiac surgeon that's there may not want you there. So understand what your environment is. Evaluate the opportunity. Uh, is, is, is there a team that's ready to be built there? Is, is, although one person may be saying this is what we want, is that what the physicians there want? Are there two CT surgery groups and three cardiology groups that are competing with another, one another and, they're, and you're, not gonna be, you're gonna be in the middle of that fight? And that's what you have to understand. Who's driving the process? Is there a hard team? And is there institutional support? Are they gonna fund the imaging person that you need? Are they gonna fund all of these things that you want? And then when you find this job, what are the, what are the hospitals or, the, or your employer's metrics for success? Is it quality? Is it volume? You know, what, what are the metrics? And understand that when you go there. So I'm gonna go through, there's a, there's a lot, but you gotta get lucky. And you know, and sometimes it's all about right time, right place. I was lucky because I found a job where I had, I had a mentor, Marty Leon, all of you know, was my mentor. But he gave me opportunities and it was, it was you, you had to work at the time, but you, you had to have those opportunities and you had the mentorship and it's the right place, right time. And I will tell you just, you know, it, it doesn't always work and you, sometimes you get lucky and that's, that's all it is. I was, uh, you know, this is a fellow's course. I was a interventional, I was a cardiology fellow and resident at UCSF um, in, in, in San Francisco. Um, my, my, men, my boss at the time, there was a lot of focus on, on basic science. We, uh, Dwayne and I, we talked about this last night. Um, and he believed everyone should do basic science, but I wanted to do interventional cardiology. I'd always been interested in structural. Um, and, there, and, he, and they were not supportive of that. And I decided to, to leave San Francisco because it was low volume and, and we di I didn't get, a, get along and I wanted to do a interventional cardiology. And I'd spent a year at the VA doing uh, interventional cardiology in my third year of cardiology fellowship. Uh, and the opportunity to, and, and, and I had just gotten married and my wife said, she gave, me, uh, she gave me some direction. If I was leaving California, she was born and raised in California, I had either New York or Chicago. Those were my two limitations. So I interviewed in, uh, in New York. I interviewed at Lenox Hill when Marty and Jeff, uh, Moses and all were at Lenox Hill. I didn't get the position as a fellow at Lenox Hill. So I decided, you know what, I'm gonna to come to New York. I'm gonna do a one-year fellowship in New York. I took, a, I took a fellowship at Columbia, and I said I'm, I'm gonna come back to uh, California after the one-year fellowship. I started my fellowship on July 1st. Uh, Marty Leon and Jeff Moses all moved to Columbia on August 15th. So, you know, it's all about right time, right place, and it's not that I was, I was smarter or anything, uh, but when the, when the opportunity finds you, you have to be able to willing to work hard. Um, and all of us have this sort of uh, things that we want to do. And, and uh, I, this was an email that I don't know why, I have, still have it saved. It was an email I had sent in March of 2003 to my research mentor at the VA. I'd always been in, involved in structural heart intervention. Um, and, I, and I said, uh, I wanted, there was an Embolex filter, which was approved for surgical uh, uh, cannulas to pre prevent uh, embolic events. And I had said I want to do a research project looking at preventing embolic events during valvuloplasty. Uh, and in, in this email, I said, I think this issue will become more important, especially if percutaneous valves become a reality in the future. I wanted to develop a filter. I thought there was a commercial application uh, for a filter for preventing embolic events. And uh, a little over 10 years later, I had the opportunity, because of M Marty's leadership and mentorship, to lead the Sentinel trial in embolic protection during transcatheter aortic valve. You know, and I never expected this or anything, but it was all about, uh, you know, sometimes things will work out, sometimes they don't, but sort of follow what you want to do and, when, and understand that the opportunities will be there at different times, and when the opportunity is there, be willing to work hard and, and, and try and push the limits. Thank you very much. De verdad que espero que hayan disfrutado eh, esta charla el día de hoy. Es una charla de mucho interés, que es muy amplio interés para todos eh, ustedes, como lo dije al principio, desde el punto de vista histórico, pero también desde el punto de vista tecnológico, viendo cómo estas tecnologías están reduciendo el riesgo del paciente por medios eh, mínimamente invasivos. Espero que hayan de, de nuevo disfrutado esta edición y nos vemos el próximo mes.